I'm interested in the improved efficiency. We have a young staff team, so I don't know if you're going to go into that, but just how we task things out and maximize our work. Just to fill the gaps. Okay. <laughs> we can't all hire a Hawkeye instructor. <laughs> <laughs> Can we kind of know why you're here? 
Yeah, I work for Peter Construction and Katie works for Cardinal Construction, so I'm just here to steal all her ideas, trade secrets. <laughs> I work for Dean Snyder Construction, so I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> as well as just learning how to like build a skill gap. We have like a lot of laborers, and then construction workers, and then like superintendents, but we want to like build the foreman and get that going. Yeah. I guess mainly just ideas of how to deal with the low unemployment. Probably similar to everyone else. I'm just kind of trying to see what you're going to talk about as far as best practices and if it's a universal thing around the state. Uh, Lisa Scaboul at the Alliance and Chamber, and just like Tammy and Megan, we collaborate a lot on best practices for business retention and expansion. I'm here for the same reason they are, so we can continue to support and grow our existing business space. And also the Echo Pam. Hi. And Dustin, do you want to add something? Or? Dustin was assigned to this room, so I don't know if you're going to take the time. Great. I really am interested in hearing uh, any tips on how we can support uh, filling the positions and, and uh, making sure that people understand that the, those, those opportunities are there when they do uh, want to go into the, you know, that type of employment. All right, so today we have three panelists from three different businesses. We have Katie Susan with Cardinal Construction. She helps guide the company's strategy with specific emphasis on new business development, income diversification, process refinement, and team development. She's passionate about team member engagement, and that's gonna come out in her responses today, and providing opportunities for leadership. Whitney Dungy is with Nestle and Waverly. She's a proud, self-labeled HR nerd, and she discovered her passion for the field while attending UNI, and currently she's in human resources at Nestle, leading the factory's training and development program. And on the end, we have Jamie Detmer, who Dave just pointed out is a former Hawkeye instructor who has migrated now into industry. He designs and implements all of the CNC machinist training and is in the process of initiating a CNC programmer and operator certified apprenticeship. So I have some prepared questions and we'll start off with those. Uh, there are some yellow sheets in the middle of your tables. If you have any questions that pop in your head, feel free to write them down. Celia, even on the east side of the room, we'll pick them up, as well as Dustin Broquet on the west side of the room. So my, I started earlier in Somebody kind of popped my bubble by answering the question Greg right off the bat, but. So, where do you think Iowa ranks with its unemployment rate across the US? Pardon? Fourth lowest. Fourth lowest. Second lowest, yeah. Second lowest, yep. I checked last week. <laughs> and anybody know the lowest? Who's number one? You said that earlier. Say that. Actually, it's Hawaii. So here you have Iowa being somewhat compared to an island in the middle of an ocean. So kind of crazy. But obviously, we're also struggling with skills gaps in our existing workforce. The low unemployment encourages us to do development within our own entities and. These three are fine examples, and as Katie mentioned too, it's a good uh, spread here. We have a small company, a large company, Nestle, is global, and medium-sized company with GMT. So with that, the first question we have is, are there factors outside of the limited available workforce that contribute to your company's decision to invest in developing your existing workforce? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Pam said, I'm Katie Susong, I'm with Cardinal Construction. Uh, yes, there are uh, outside factors beyond the limited workforce that uh, contribute to our decision to invest in training. And about six years ago, um, we went through some pretty big changes. We brought on some different staff, um, kind of changed the direction we were going as a company. And, and 
it's been kind of a slow change, but an intentional change to our culture to be more people focused, uh, to invest in the people that we have on our team, um, to make sure that they know and understand their value within Cardinal Construction and that um, somebody in our field staff has just as much value and just as much insight into how we operate as a company as our president, as people on our leadership team. Um, training goes along with that. Um, when we allow our employees to take an active role in kind of setting their course with regard to training, uh, we feel like that uh, only contributes to that engaged workforce, to our engaged culture. Um, and so we've seen success with that. Uh, to your point earlier, younger staff. Um, unfortunately, our field staff is, is not young. Our field staff is older. Um, which is another issue that we're battling. But in our office, most of our staff, um, due to turnover within the last several years, is under age 30. So I'm one of the older people uh, in our office, which is great. Uh, but anyway, uh, to that point, um, we've had to look to training because A, they're coming in with less experience, um, and B, there's just a desire by the younger generation that's coming in to know more, to do more. They're, they're engaged and they're excited and they want to be able to offer new ideas and they want to be able to impact change. And so that, that is another thing that is driving, um, driving our training at Cardinal. Besides the low unemployment rate in Iowa, there are several other contributing factors, especially in the manufacturing industry which really drive our need and desire to invest in our workforce from a training and development aspect. And it really boils down to two main factors for, for Nestle. One really pertains to certifications. Can I get a show of hands on how many industries in this room or do you work with industries that require certifications either by their customers, by regulatory agencies? Okay, see a couple, yep. So for Nestle, we have some certifications relating to like ISO, FSSC is a quality food safety requirement, and really that drives our need for compliance training and also really above and beyond just compliance training as well. So that right there is why we're investing in our workforce to keep our customers happy, right? Meet their expectations, but also the flip side of that, and most important, is as an employee advocate, it's the right thing to do to invest in our workforce. When we think about our current people, our population, in our factories, in our work environments, you're gonna get more out of investing in individuals who are willing to learn than outsourcing that, or hiring and regaining and then seeing that turnover, right? So we're really at the foundation it's the right thing to do to grow our talent with the skills shortage. GMT has uh, a fair amount of turnover. Uh, we have a very recently hired uh, machinist staff. And, and so one of the reasons I was hired was to be able to work with these people that are coming in um, and just continue their training past their 120 days uh, with their mentor. Um, I do some basic training classes they're called, and um, it's 30 hours of classroom time where we we just we look at blueprints, we do some math, we just make sure everybody's kind of up at the same level. And then we're gonna take that training, once we catch up with the hiring a little bit, we're gonna take that training a little bit further. Um, and then, of course, the apprenticeship that we're starting in January is, uh, is also gonna help out with that, with the uh, Hawkeye curriculum and uh, uh, the hours in the classroom and the hours of on the job learning. So, for businesses, a concern is employee time away from the job spent training is often a leading argument to not do training. So, how do each of your companies communicate the value and the benefit of internal training? I think for us, at our company, we share a belief that by investing in training and by providing our employees and our team members opportunities to learn new skills, we're only increasing our productivity and 
increasing our capacity uh, to work well. Um, along the same vein that Whitney mentioned earlier, we do have different regulations that and certifications that we're required to maintain um, as contractors. And we're seeing more and more that projects are bidding and including in the specification that we require staff on site that have certifications. And so really for us, it's a necessity in order for us to continue to serve our clients in the capacity that they need us to, we need to invest in training. We really communicate the benefit and value of internal training by starting one-on-one -on -one with the employee, whether they are an employee with longevity in our organization, maybe moving or transferring to another big job because we are a union facility, or maybe a new employee that we hire externally by saying, we are gonna be spending the time and resources to invest in you and you need to be willing to learn. Your job's never gonna look the same. We're gonna be continuing to, continuing to grow. And as we all know, especially in uh, the manufacturing sector, we're rapidly growing. So we need that basic mentality with our recruits to understand that what you do five years ago is gonna look maybe differently and we all need to adapt. But part of that is giving those employees that expectation that they understand that continuous learning is going to be a part of their journey and career at Nestle. Of course, I could probably tie training, return on investment, to a number of different metrics because with Nestle being a global organization, we track everything. <laughs> we have stats on what we call asset intensity, machine capabilities, we have safety metrics, we have quality achievements that we directly tie. We can probably say training really helped drive these results. Uh, but really, the best way that we actually communicate the value of that training to our employees is by just really ensuring and gaining that buy-in and that cultural understanding that it's just going to be a part of your job requirement. For what our machinists are running as far as equipment and, and parts, uh, it's very easy to justify the cost of the training. Um, several hours spent in training plus loss of productivity is very cheap compared to uh, crashing a million dollar machine or scrapping multiple parts that cost $2,000 a piece. So um, it's an easy justification. <coughs> Excuse me. The um, GMT's had a long history with training. Um, they've contracted with Hawkeye over several years. Um, and what they really wanted to do with my position is just have the ability to follow up, do the training, work with the people out on the floor. Um, obviously not everything that you cover in class or that they learn from their mentor during their first 120 days is gonna be transferable to when they start working by themselves. So I can walk around, um, I can work different shifts, I can just be there to help them out if they run into problems. Third question, how do your employees respond to training that may not fall within their wheelhouse that they were hired for? So a fire truck operator being trained even in safety or perhaps unloading, loading, upset, can I? So we, we don't have a huge issue with this. And I think it's because we've made um, a real intentional effort to set the stage earlier. So whether that is when we hire them as part of the onboarding process or uh, annually as part of the performance coaching process, we set the expectation that there's certainly going to be training that is going to relate to your job, but then there's other training that you may not feel is quite as directly um, or doesn't correlate quite as, quite as closely with what you do. Um, but I, I think it's all about setting the expectation early so that people understand that as a company, we believe it's important to, to train in a variety of different things and that, that may or may not relate directly to, to an individual certain position. Do we have any union companies here? Okay. Nestle Waverly is a union company. So this is something that when new job requirements spur subsequent training, it's something that changes the working conditions of our workforce, right? Or maybe a particular position. So in that case, there has to be a lot of pre-communication 
in discussions with the union about how those new job, job tasks will create a different outlook on that job, right? It's not as scary as what, what you think. I actually worked prior at a, a very small company, not a union facility, and now I'm working for a large uh, corporation in a union environment. And it's just a different way of working through it, right? So when it comes to asking positions to complete training that fall without maybe outside of their wheelhouse, it's just more pre-communication. Explaining, sitting down and saying, this is how these jobs have changed and this is now the following expectations we have for this job and working together with the union to get to that outcome together. I feed them. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised how much they can change their attitude. <laughs> I got rid of all the Halloween candy we didn't give away. My girlfriend likes to vape, so no. We offer, um, we offer training to pretty much anyone within the organization that expresses interest. So um, I gave the example this morning, we had uh, an individual that got hired in the fab shop for chipping and grinding, very entry level position, indicated that he liked some more training. So he attended uh, the second basic training class that I did. Went through it, tested at the end, not quite satisfied with where he got. So about a third of the way through this, this last class, or the one I'm teaching right now, invited him back again. So he's back in there, he's not running a machine yet, but it sounds like that's where he's headed as soon as this class is over. Okay. Are there any types of training that you are providing today that you would not have thought you would have needed to provide to your workforce five, 10 years ago? Uh, so five, 10 years ago, Cardinal didn't really have a training program in place. In fact, all of the training that we did was training that we were required to do to maintain certifications uh, and competencies on our job sites. Um, we've gone the opposite direction uh, in the last couple of years, which I'm really proud of and, and excited about. Um, one particular training that we are doing now that we didn't do before was computer skills training. It's different for the younger people that are coming in, but we have a lot of our staff that are just not comfortable with computers, let alone iPads and utilizing apps for project management and scheduling. And so that's something we've really had to take a look at because that's the way that our project managers are communicating, um, and that's, that's kind of the way that construction is going, generally speaking. Uh, the other uh, area that we're training in more than we ever did in the past was uh, soft skills. Uh, we've started doing workplace sensitivity training, which took a little bit of work. I guess I'd say if there was any that we got pushed back on, uh, it's telling general contractors that they're going to go spend a couple hours learning to be more sensitive. Uh, so anyway, uh, but that, that is certainly a component of our job, communicating respectfully, um, whether that's with each other or with our clients. So um, yeah, the soft skills training has, has been a big addition. Absolutely, we are offering different sets of training compared to 10 years ago at Nestle. And part of working for a global organization, it's the double-edged sword, right? We have access to a lot of resources and a lot of knowledge and a lot of people who sometimes tell us what to do at a factory level, who maybe work at a corporate level and don't really understand how a factory works. Um, I can tell you that from a compliance standpoint, on a calendar basis, we have to administer about 80 safety, health, and environmental training requirements and about 40 quality requirements, all compliance related. That doesn't even include a lot of the soft skills that Katie has mentioned that we see value in providing to our workforce, such as training techniques where we spend time with salary and hourly employees talking about how to be a good trainer. What are the character, characteristic, characteristics of a good trainer? And what are the outputs that you will receive and the results that will actually come from conservative training efforts? Also, we offer grow coaching to our salary staff to better communicate and get to a root cause mindset and really launch a new level of problem solving in all aspects of our business. 
No, I don't think the apprenticeship for CNC machining um, would have been something that we would have looked at 10 years ago just because, not because it's not a good thing, but because the pipeline, there was enough people in it. It wasn't as big of a deal to develop from within. Um, I went through an apprenticeship 25 years ago for tool making. And that was, you know, that was a big thing back, and it still is. Um, but tool making had several more components to it than running a CNC machine, so it was a, it was a more in-depth process. But, I, so I think the, the apprenticeship is, is really something that's grown out of uh, lack of, of skilled workers in this area. Oftentimes when you get people out of, again, training outside of their wheelhouse, what they were hired for, then they start thinking, I should be making more money. So my next question is, is do you have pushback from employees about why they have to participate in training that don't seem relevant to what they're doing at your place of work today? So we do not. We do not tie we do not tie training requirement to compensation. In fact, we don't tie performance to compensation. Uh, kind of a radical change that we've made as a company in the last couple of years. Um, instead, what we do is each year we have our employees actually prepare a list of goals uh, based on some information and questions that we gather. They then take those goals and meet with an advisor then is responsible for over the next year serving as a guide, uh, coaching them, ensuring that they're accountable to meeting the goals that they themselves have established. Part of that, uh, part of that whole process is the, the training component, and that really develops out of a desire uh, that the employees have. So it's really driven by uh, our team members to have training that matches well with the goals that they've set for themselves. Now, of course, as an organization, operationally, we look every year, we identify shortfalls, areas for improvement, uh, and, and that coincides with this individual performance coaching process that we have. So there's there's some tie-in so that, you know, we don't have an individual that says, you know, I want to do this or that, and it doesn't tie back with what we as a company see as needs for strategic growth. So um, we don't get a lot of pushback about why they have to participate in training, and a lot of that stems from the fact that really they themselves are um, creating the path that they have for training themselves. So it's really um, employee driven. No, we do not tie training to compensation at Nestle. We really take the stance that Completing training, especially from the compliance training stream, is a job requirement. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. You have to get it done by the designated deadlines. And you must participate and be engaged in the process as well. However, with that being said, we have a great feedback routine where let's say that we have a matrix on who in the factory is applicable when it comes to power industrial truck training, right? And maybe 20 out of the 26 hourly positions have to go through that training. And let's say that a can line operator comes up to me and says, I don't know why I'm doing this training with you. X, Y, Z, give me all these reasons. We go through that interactive process and I really wanna listen because there's a reason. No one knows their job better than that individual. And then I get the decision maker involved, which would be our safety, health, and environmental manager, because really the decision for PIT applicability comes from that department, not myself. And we go through that interactive process to say, why don't you think you need this training? And sometimes it's really good challenges from our employees, because when we think about it, um, especially from a Nestle perspective, hourly employees have to be compensated for actually attending training on overtime. So if we have 20 people in the can line operator position that we say have to go through PIT training that probably really don't have to, that can equate to a lot of money on a yearly basis on overtime. GMT doesn't currently um, type paid to training, but the uh, apprenticeship 
the standards through the Department of Labor, the apprenticeship has to have a minimum salary as a year as you uh, you progress through the apprenticeship. So it will once that starts, um, there will be uh, pay advances as long as they're doing what they're supposed to do with the apprenticeship. And then combine a question that I had previously uh, given the panel with one that had been submitted. So we talked before about can you share an outcome or two that is a result of upskilling? But before that, can you answer what are a few important skills that you're actually looking for in the workforce to be able to bring them in? So skills that you're bringing in and how are you upskilling? Uh, skills that we are looking for uh, in people that we are going to bring on to our team are communication. Can they talk to us? Can they talk to clients? Can they communicate well with those out in the field with them? Um, I think that's, that's critical. Um, are they teachable? We want people that are going to come in and be willing to learn, um, that are not set in their ways, that are you know, looking for an opportunity to potentially improve upon how they've always done something. Uh, we're looking for people that are willing to be a part of a team. In construction, it's, it, that's critical. Um, nothing that we do is independent of, of anything uh, anyone else does on our team, whether that's in the office or in the field. Um, you know, if I can't go out and secure a job, uh, that creates real issues for people out in the field. Uh, the same token, if they are performing and getting things done on time and to the level of quality that we have promised, that's a problem. So um, being able to work as part of a team, understanding the contribution to the team, um, also important. And uh, a willing, sorry, did you? Do you mind if I ask a question? I oh, bring it on. Um, I've heard this many times in every session, even with the main session, people say communication, okay? And as a high school principal, we tell kids, you gotta be able to communicate. And they say, like, what do you mean? Literally, what do you mean? Those are the words. Speak to that. That's fair. I'm a communication major. People okay. ask me all the time, what's that mean? I don't really know. Uh, no, no, but um, for me, communication means the ability to speak well, um, just the, the whole idea of verbally communicate an idea to somebody else, um, whether that's in communication over an email, sounding in, you know intelligible through email, um, or over the phone or in a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, so kind of the very basic idea of how we communicate with each other, um, but also communicating an idea clearly. I think that's, you know, we work, we work very conceptually in construction, and so the idea to be able to take something that's complex and make it um, something that our clients can understand who aren't in the process of building every day uh, is important as well. Um, so I think that's really what I mean by communication. I guess on the other side of that, there's the challenge in communication when you've got to translate a, something that's not easy to say. Um, I think too often we get people that come in that, you know, when there's a conflict or there's an issue at stake, um, the gut reaction is to, I'm just not going to deal with that. And we can't have that in construction. We work on schedules. And so things need to be dealt with in a timely manner. And so I think um, conflict, communicating in conflict, is also a big one. Does that answer your question? Very good, thank you. Okay, super. I would say the same to those two if you're willing to take So when it comes to what we're looking for in the communication realm, I completely agree and align with what Katie said, but I also want to put in just listening. Because part of communication is listening. And when it comes to, and again, um, I am barred by what I know, and I've um, only worked in manufacturing since being in college and, and, and beyond. And it's really important to understand how important listening is within your job, especially in the technical skilled trades. Um, important no matter what you do, right? But especially in technical trades, because when we think about when you're learning on the job for CNC machining, for operation, for electrical controls, 
you are learning from people with longevity, 30 plus years of 30 plus years of experience. And when we think about how training really occurs and in that environment, it's a lot of tribal knowledge that's shared. Right? I mean, vastly we're getting better at actually writing down processes that tie to job tasks when it comes to on the job training, but we're not there yet. And I think a lot of other companies aren't there yet either. So you're learning one-on-one -on -one in a job shadow situation. So it's really important to listen, but then also not being afraid to ask questions as well. And really self-identifying, okay, if I don't really understand something, communicating back and articulating what do I know and what do I don't know. Ability to follow written and verbal instructions is, is a big one too. Um, attention to detail. Uh, the tolerances that we're working with are so small that it's hard to even, if you're not used to, to dealing with it, it's hard to even uh, visualize it. So attention to detail is a huge one, along with everything else. <laughs> Um, it's, it's changing so much with the skills that we're looking for. Um, Ten years ago, they wanted somebody that could come in and after a week jump to an off shift and run the machine. Um, now they're, they're really looking at um, your attitude, your ability to learn, whether you're willing to take on the additional training. Um, those are the big things. Um, I would say you know, it would be great to find people that have a lot of the other skills, but right now there's just not there. Um, Upskilling, we do the basic training class. Um, we're working on advanced training. They spend, depending on how fast, well, I back up, depending on the work cell they get put into and depending on how fast they pick it up, they might spend anywhere from three weeks to six, maybe eight weeks with a mentor uh, learning the job. Um, and, and it's it's, it's pretty in-depth. You don't you not only have to run the machine, change tools, um, load and unload parts, you have to gauge the parts, you have, so you have to check it. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that goes on. And for someone that's not used to that environment, it can be very overwhelming. So um, asking good questions is, is really, it's key too. You know, knowing when to say, hey, you're moving too fast, I need to slow down. I'm not learning this stuff. You're, you're, you're sending it my way too, too quickly. The only other workforce skill that we really look for that haven't been touched by my colleagues is I'm looking for resourcefulness. I, I, when it comes to the skills gap and that technical workforce that we're really missing, um, we absolutely need people who can follow directions, right? But with how rapidly evolving manufacturing is changing, we need people who are resourceful. Because oftentimes what we see is some, well, I followed the standard of this work instruction and I didn't get to where I needed to be. But did you ask a question? Did you escalate that issue? Really looking for those individuals who are resourceful and go to that problem solving state and really can see the micro or big picture aspect and how it affects every single department. Another uh, question we have received from the audience is, what is your worker turnover look like? Is it high? And do you know why the employees are leaving? And if it's low, what are you doing to keep them? So, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, in the last several years, we really have been intentional about trying to create a culture where people understand their value. Um, value as members of our team. And we have seen the results of that. Um, the average turnover rate in construction for firms of our size is about 21%. And over the last couple of years, we have seen turnover rates more in line with seven to 11%. So we are retaining our employees, and I think it comes from the fact that um, our employees um, know that they are more than a number to us, that uh, if they have an idea, that it's going to be 
listened to and taken into account, and in most cases, um, we're gonna follow through on it. I mentioned this morning that I think the worst thing you can do as uh, an employer is ask for feedback from your um, team members and have them give you feedback and then do nothing with it. Um, I think that's the quickest way to a disengaged workforce. And so, um, really by just, by investing in our employees, for seeking their, their knowledge, um, like Whitney said, we've got people um, that have been with our company for 45 years. Um, to not use that knowledge uh, would be a shame. And at the same time, we've got people that have been there for three years or less. Um, and they are coming with new ideas, they're coming with new insight, uh, better ways to do what we've always done, and there's a lot of value in that too. So I think. Our lack of turnover comes from the fact that people recognize that they are a value member of our team at heart. And they're not going anywhere. You hear that, Peters? <laughs> <laughs> Nestle has a relatively low turnover rate for the industry, and I'd love to say it is because of our training and development program, but it's not. It's because of our pay and benefits. Let's just be honest. <laughs> Um, but, but with that said, once employees pass our probationary period at Nestle, they have longevity within our organization. So when you think about that, it kind of goes back to what we've been saying, and especially my comment in the beginning, it makes more sense to invest in your current employees and to build that skill set internally. Um, when it comes to turnover rates, our higher turnover rates really come from our salary position. Who here struggles with um, frontline leader? Fills, attainment, recruiting. We struggle with it, especially because we are a three shift operation. <laughs> Not a lot of people want to be a supervisor on an off shift, right? Second or third. We have opportunities, so even if someone joins Nestle at an entry level on the hourly side, we actually have had, in the last year, five supervisor positions filled from the floor. And when we think about that, think about how much knowledge is being transferred and how much they are ahead of the game versus someone who maybe comes from a different facility that we hire externally, there is worth in that. And really, it's about showing up, okay? Yep, they have the technical aspects, they understand the business background, but, what can we do from them? What can we do for them to develop them as a leader? And we have great resources around the area, such as Hawkeye Community College has a lead cert certification and leadership classes, um, and there there are plenty of options available to close that leadership gap. GMT has a relatively high turnover, um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. You're bringing in people that have never ran machines before. They, they find out they can do it, they move on. Um, sometimes they find out they don't like it, they move on. Um, kind of the running internal joke is we train a lot of John Deere employees. Um, they come there, they find out what they're doing, they go to John Deere. So, and John Deere's one of our biggest customers, so they like it. Um, they're, they're pretty vocal about that too. So. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons I got brought in. That's one of the reasons this position got created is to deal with, uh, I think, I was given a number the other day and I think it's within the last six months they've hired 46 machine operators and 43 have quit. So it's not obviously the 46 necessarily that they hired, it's some from before that, before that. So um, it's kind of a little bit of a revolving door. Um, I just like to, Say this one thing, because I think we skipped over it and I wrote a note on it. <laughs> so, um, I just want to share an outcome that training and, de and development has really driven. It's been a collection of, of initiatives, but Nestle has gone over two years without a recordable injury, which is huge. Yeah, I mean, every single employee ha was engaged in that process. And it was a collection of initiatives which led to that achievement, but with no doubt, training and development and the concerted efforts that were put to give employees the training and share those expectations to work safely definitely was a part of that. A question from the audience? 
is, Katie, you stated compensation is not related to performance. What type of a system do you use? Okay, so up until um, within the last couple of years, we did the traditional performance review process. We you know, had them fill out a thing, survey, had, their, had the superintendents fill out a survey, basically, you know, one to five, how are they performing in this or that capacity? Um, and what we were finding is we would do these reviews in December and we'd bring them in and we'd say, hey, good job, you, you did this, you did this, congratulations, that's great. Um, and here's a couple areas for improvement, and here is a compensation increase based on how you did last year. And what we were finding is that the process wasn't very engaging. Our employees went away from it kind of going, okay, I got my pat on the back, um, but I, I'm not gonna change my behavior tremendously in any way. And so with this new process, the idea Really, it's intended to engage the employees further, to um, set goals so that when we're talking about performance, it's based on things they can actually change, not what they've done in the past. And um, so I guess to say that performance is not entirely related, sure, that, that there's a component, but it's more about seeing progress than you did this or that or you accomplished X or Y. Um, really what we want to see is engaged employees that are um, taking part in their own process, that they are um, striving independently to meet their own goals, that they're not um, entirely driven by the company. Um, and so admittedly, this is it's all pretty young, and so I'd love to say it's great, it, it has been super successful, and um, but I, I don't know that for sure yet. Like I said, our turnover rate has been low, and I, and I think this is part of the collective change that we've made to, to be more uh, employee focused. Um, so I guess the short answer to that is performance is a component, but it's, it's not the only component. We wanna see progress, we wanna see growth in our people. One thing that we had talked about in the morning session as well was types of learning. Some people are, can read from a book and learn. Some people need to be instructed and some people need to have the hands-on opportunity. So Whitney, can you tell us a little bit more about how you guys integrate the three? So we really test employees to understand what are their preferred learning me methods. So as Pam said, there's audio learners, there's visual learners, and there's kinesthetic learners or learners by doing. Sometimes it can be a blend of all three. And so we really try to make a, an effort to understand the trainee when they come in, especially from an on-the-job um, situation, that's kind of where I'm speaking to, try to understand what's the best way that you learn. And we try, even if you are more of an audio learner, to really make sure that you see all aspects of that learning, because you don't know what you don't know, right? You might not know that I um, definitely prefer to learn by someone instructing me, but maybe I validate my learning by actually doing it. So our on-the-job training from an hourly perspective, we have three components to verify or validate learning at Nestle, and we have what's called qualification checklists per position, which is really an outline of, okay, as a bagline operator, here are all the safety requirements that you have to learn, the quality requirements, our Nestle continuous excellence, which really is around problem solving, and then it gets into the actual technical aspects of your job, and it's broken out by machine center. And in that, for each learning point, there is a tell, show, and do column where they would actually have to, okay, I'm being told about this learning point from my trainer. Now they're actually showing me. Now I actually did it, and then there's a sign-off process with the trainer and the trainee to validate that they went through all three steps, and that's a validation procedure. In addition, Nestle's getting better at really documenting processes, because as we talked about earlier, it's a lot of tribal knowledge, it's a lot of job shadowing, right? We need to do a better job of actually documenting how to successfully complete a changeover when it comes to a different product run on a particular line on a particular machine center. So it starts up the way Monty, who has been on line one for 
30 years with someone who's three years in, right? We kind of want to get to that point. So then also in that same training point, you show the employee, you tell the employee how to do it, you show, they do it, and there's a sign off for validation, but then there is a resources section to say, this is where you can find step-by-step -step instructions relating to this learning point. if there is a language barrier, right? And also, some things that we don't think about is also a reading barrier. Can someone not read that well? Does someone have a learning disability, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, but in that case, what I would do is I would reach out to Hawkeye Community College because they have a great um, English as a Second Language program. I really try to, to work around those lines to try and give the employee every opportunity to be successful in that position. So although we haven't encountered that, that's probably how I would brainstorm a way to ensure the employee has success. And you're just saying you have an encounter with the because I work in marketing too, so I didn't know what you meant by that as opposed to natural. So we we haven't encountered anyone who has struggled with like a language barrier who doesn't speak English. Oh, okay. I guess I would follow up and say that honestly. For us, it comes down to resources. We certainly are missing that population of people um, working for us because we don't have the people that can speak the language. We don't, you know, but it's hard. It's a, it's a real issue. Um, we do have people uh, that speak different languages on our job sites, and I'm I'm just trying to be real with you. I we. No, I appreciate it. It's, it's, yeah. it's something that we need to address, but I feel like we struggle with resources to be able to address that issue as a, as a smaller company, um, to try and employ somebody full-time, or particularly to accommodate lots of different language barriers, either through speaking or reading. Um, but yeah, I, I'd say we're certainly missing that workforce because we have not found a way that works for us yet to be able to communicate in the way that um, would make them feel like they can come to our company. So I'm not saying that um, that's not something we shouldn't do. We certainly should. Um, and I'd love to see us take strides in that. Um, we just haven't gotten there yet. Thank you. I appreciate it. Pam, I might have a little bit about that. So we just recently hired somebody out of the IBEST program, and his main language is French. And part of the IBES program was they had to learn English language and be able to speak a little bit. But what we found out was after we hired him, there was still a language barrier. So what the trainer did was that he downloaded an app and he would speak into it and then it would translate the language for him and that would kind of help them explain the processes that were going on on the machines. So that's, and then our hope is, is after he gets trained, he's gonna be our translator for when we want to hire other people that speak other languages. The trainer also taught him naughty words, but <laughs> <laughs> I think that kind of helped, like, you know, treat him like one of their own, one of our own, yeah. Sam, do you want to chime in on what some of the companies are doing? Yeah. As far as how to get the language barrier? So currently, uh, I work at Hawkeye Community College, and what my team does is we help these businesses upskill their employees and work staff. What we're working with recently is master brands as well as a veterinary business in independence. We are taking a instructor in that speaks the language natively. And what they're doing is it's gonna be similar <coughs> to the IBES program, 
that Melissa just spoke about. What it is is it teaches them to speak in the language that you're going to hear on the job, the work-specific words and vocabulary. And so far, um, that has been going very well. And we're doing it both ways. The employees that speak English are learning some Spanish so they can communicate more and one of the speakers Spanish so they can communicate more effectively. Um, we have a trucking, a trucking company that goes down to Texas um, and once they get further south in Texas all of the dispatchers they speak to are speaking in Spanish and there's a huge barrier when they get down that way. Um, so some of, so the drivers are learning Spanish to be able to communicate better when they go that way. Um, and then in, at the veterinary clinic, a bunch of the veterinarians are from Mexico, and so they're teaching them to speak more English, and then the staff that they work with to speak Spanish so that they can, they're both learning both ways. We're not, I don't want, I don't want it to sound like everybody's learning English either, because but, so, well, many of our companies are doing it both ways, we're, that way we can communicate both, so. I, I guess I'm kind of curious, do you have any insight into how about the recruiting process because obviously it's one thing to, to bring somebody on and have them there working with you and to be going through that but it's another to create um, a culture that you know recruits that recruits people from different cultures so do you have any insight in your experience with these other companies as to how they actually are um, attracting those that's a great question. I think the best thing I heard was from Kyle Rose, who's yes. over at Sea Camera Ops Camp now. Um, they were trying to overcome some barriers. They were trying to get up to a population that had limited access to transportation, um, limited access to child care. They started providing, um, they, they, they're trying to help eliminate those barriers. So if you didn't have transportation, they would provide you a bus pass for your first month of employment so you could afford your own bus pass to get everybody in the door and get them comfortable and, and they were doing the same thing. There are probably, if you reach out to Kim from HR group, there are probably some other HR managers that could elaborate on how they're recruiting from different populations. I know the iVest has been really great for... Um, I know Cloud has people learning us, so he went to the people learning. Yes. He went to the communities, the different communities, versus um, just putting an ad or letting yeah. other employees word of mouth tell them about it. So he partnered with a, a church question was how do you hire those types of people my thing was connections I think every time I saw Pam every time I was down at workforce development I'm like we need machinists like what can we do we need machinists and I finally someone said hey we have this iBest program and then they gave me a business card and they said they want people to come and speak so it was just talking to people and knowing people and they were like they give you contacts and I went down there and spoke and that next day ten of them were out of my business wanting to work so just know our people. It is. It's networking. It's, yeah. it's huge. Okay, I want to go back and revisit. The buzzword this year seems to be apprenticeships. So I kind of want to go back to what Jamie's gig is up at GMT. I'd like to have him talk about the program because to me it's unique. Typically in an apprenticeship, uh, it's well known that you just go and learn. You work the trade and 
after so many hours you successfully complete that apprenticeship with that business. What's different up at GMT is they are also going to be awarded some credit hours. So they are actually going to have a certificate and degree by the time they are done. So Jamie, do you want to talk about that a little bit? The apprenticeship, the CNC machinist and operator apprenticeship, is, it has two components, the 8,000 hours of on-the-job learning and then 720 hours of classroom. Those are requirements through the Department of Labor. If you have people that come in with degrees already, obviously the classroom portion is, is taken care of, they just need the on-the-job learning time. Um, because we're hiring so many people without uh, degrees and skill sets like that, um, we're gonna partner with Hawkeye Community College, and um, I met with Dave and Dr. Bradley, and since I was a recent instructor there, um, the Department of Ed has given their approval for me to teach credit classes at GMT. So the apprentices, I have a, a five-year plan laid out. They're gonna get 34 credits. They'll complete the first semester of the CNC program. They'll have that done, they'll get a certificate and they'll get about 75% of the second semester. Um, so when they get done along with their journey worker certificate from the Department of Labor, they will have those credit classes you know, in, their, in their toolkit. If they, wanna, if they wanna go back to school, a lot of them will be working off shifts. They can take a class or two here or there and complete their degree you know, in the remaining how many ever years it takes. But, that's kind of how we set it up. We, we talked about doing some online learning um, through NIMS or through one other, I can't think of it right now, but with the way the classes lined up, with the way the hours for the apprenticeship went, it just kind of fell into place and they're good classes, it's a good curriculum, um, so I feel pretty confident that's gonna fit pretty well with the apprenticeship. Something I just want to touch on regarding just general resources. If you as a nonprofit or for-profit company or even economic development, if you're helping other companies, look into state grants to help offset costs of your training dollars. So for example, last year I applied for the 260F in collaboration with Hawkeye Community College. We were awarded $25,000 to help assist with our, our training funds. There's also a 260E out there. I don't know how long it will be available, right? Because grant funds are a little volatile. But 260Es, if you can prove, you know, tell me if I'm misspeaking, but if you can prove that you are going to grow, it's it's quite a bit of money. That and that's really really great from like a startup company aspect. If you're working in um, economic development, to really pitch those funds. And then also there are WTEDs available for nonprofits, which I just learned this morning in that session. So there are training funds available for the complete scope of, of employers out there. And if you're not looking into it, I would highly encourage it. We, got, we spoke a little bit after the meeting that uh, we also utilize grant funding, um, state grant funding in coordination with Hawkeye. And it really has enabled us to offer a lot of different programming and a lot of different training our team um, in the last couple of years that we've, that we've utilized that. So it certainly uh, reduces the burden of cost associated with training and um, can make that an easier sell if you've got to you know, present that information to your leadership team too, that we're getting all of this great training for less money. So it's a good resource. Just an example of some of the types of training that these guys do would be for Katie's company, we brought in Bluebeam. And with Bluebeam, it's a unique contractor management software, and it's so specialized that obviously we had nobody in the Cedar Valley available as a subject matter expert to run it. So we were able to fly someone from Bluebeam and from California to work with the staff at Nestle, we do quite a bit of safety training, and it's very unique because they focus on, like she said a little bit earlier, but they focus on training the trainer. They want to make sure that the skills are migratable from the individuals that are doing the instruction to the learners, and that, again, that it is comprehended and they prove that it is. Um, we're in our last few minutes. Do we have any other final questions? I guess Pam, I have one. It's kind of a little outside, but but all three.
three of you come from industries that are not the most glamorous from the standpoint of attracting people, encouraging people to go into their industries. What have, what have your companies done to, you know, to try to encourage people to go into the construction industry and the manufacturing? Uh, so real briefly, I'll speak to our industry association. Uh, I would say that as an organization, uh, we've done less. It's, we have no issue recruiting project managers, estimators, people to work in our office. People that work in our field, it's a different story. And a lot of those people um, traditionally have come from referral. We get people, uh, we do offer a little bonus to our employees, our incentive, that if they bring somebody in, Reward for that. So that's been helpful. But um, Master Builders of Iowa is our industry as association. And they um, have actually got this full fledged Build Iowa campaign with its own website and um, curriculum for people that want to go in and talk to the high schools, talk to counselors, to teachers, um, that they have all on their website to be utilized. Um, in addition to that, they're hosting career fairs, they're um, actually, they're, there's a leadership class through NBI uh, that happens once a year, and their focus now every year for the foreseeable future is workforce recruitment. So they're putting a ton of resource into getting people into our industry, um, which is helpful to those of us that, that have less resource for doing the same thing. Um, I would say that definitely dovetailing off of Katie, really community outreach is really important to attract people to the manufacturing industry. I worked for a smaller privately held manufacturer before going to Nestle. With Nestle, you kind of have that stigmatism around the name, right? And the benefits that we offer, the longevity, we're gonna be celebrating, I think, 100 years in the community here in the next five years or so. So. Um, but in terms of when I was at United Equipment Accessories, it was a lot of being part of uh, EMC Square. It was a lot of working with Jamie when he was at Hawkeye and <laughs> really getting into the CNC program, connecting with students, offering internships, and really um, having that the boots on the ground mentality, talking with career fairs everywhere, um, right? But then also, I believe that it's really about talking with people one-on-one. -on -one. Whenever I get a chance to talk with young people, I really talk about manufacturing. You really have the opportunity to kind of soar wherever you want to go. And what better opportunity if, you're, if you don't know really for sure what you want to do at a high school, right? It's okay. You have the opportunity to go work for a manufacturing employer. Really, anybody now has tuition assistance. They can pay your way through college. Right? They could invest in you, and you can climb a ladder that way. So there are other alternatives than just going to college right away after high school. You stole my thunder with the MC Square. <laughs> <laughs> explain, Jamie, explain what it is. Uh, it's Exploring Manufacturing Careers Consortium. It is, uh, it's a program where students between their junior, senior year in high school take credit classes at Hawkeye or at Waverly High School or Independence High School, depending on where they're located. Um, we try to make it as close for them as possible. Uh, they start out on the first semester curriculum, so they'll take some manual machining courses their first summer, the summer between their senior year and when they come to Hawkeye, or hopefully they come to Hawkeye, um, they get CNC um, machining and programming. So when they, with their first semester at Hawkeye, they're technically a semester ahead of everybody else. Uh, the courses don't cost them anything, and um, they, there's also an opportunity now, I believe they're going to continue it for uh, competitive internships um, their senior year, after their senior year, at companies that want to um, participate. GMT has been a big sponsor of EMC Squared through, from the beginning, um, so it's, it's a it's a great program. I wish it would have been in place when I was in high school. Um, you know, it knocks off quite a bit of your bill for tuition. Gets you in front of potential employers. Gives you the opportunity to really see what it's about before you're fully committed. So if you don't like it, you don't have, you know, you don't have money and time put into it. You can change and do something else. Wrap up. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess I want to thank our panelists today for taking.
taking the entire day off of their jobs to be here with us. Uh, looking forward to everyone else staying and participating with us as we continue to brainstorm and keep the synergy going with the initiatives to make the Cedar Valley better. So thank you for coming. We appreciate it. We have a 15. We have a 15 minute break and then we, and they're going to take all the walls out again. And, and then as Pam said, it's, it's time to generate ideas. So all of you have an opportunity to share your ideas on different workers' channels. So thank you.